IBM T.J. Watson Research Center as a postdoc. After that, uh, he joined Bell Laboratories at Murray Hill, New Jersey as a staff member. Uh, that's where I first met uh, Dr. Lopez, and we worked together um, on many different projects, and um, it's been a pleasure working with him. So um, at Bell Labs, he developed optical uh, MEMS technology for applications that have included communication, lithography, imaging, and sensing. And um, since 2009, he has been working at the Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argo National Laboratory. He is also a fellow of the Institute for Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. Uh, he has uh, offered more than 120 technical publications, over 30 granted and pending United States patents, and has over 100 invited talk, given over 100 inv invited talk all over the world. And today he's going to tell us about spatially reconfigurable photonic systems. So without further delay, let's welcome Dr. Lopez. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Amit. I don't know if it was a pleasure to work together in Berlin, but that's, a, that's another story. <laughs> that, uh, I'm glad to be here. I mean, this is a beautiful weather. I'm coming from Chicago. Believe me, this is a beautiful weather. <laughs> and, 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 and you you can you shouldn't be calling winter these <laughs> these days. Is uh, <laughs> what I'll I'll show you today. I was having a busy morning talking with quite a few of you, and I should have prepared this talk in a different way. But but I, I'll be jumping from all over the place. But please ask me a lot of questions. Feel free to uh, to interrupt me. Interrupt me. But uh, what I will be showing is how the field of optical MEMS has been evolving from doing very cool things, like Stanley was saying that we did at Bell Labs, to I will show you what are the limitations today <laughs> when the people is going from these micro machines to nano machines, what are the problems, why, why you do not see products involving these nano, nano machines. And I will show you how the technology is evolving to a more complicated structures, and, and I hope to convince you that there is a big need for devices like that. And, and I'm making a quick summary now of what I will try to show you during the talk, just telling you that what we all consider glasses, what they, well, were the piece of glass that we call lenses or, or, or any variety of optical component that, you, you, that we like, is becoming more of a problem for a lot of applications <coughs> that the technology is trying, trying to do. Almost more, most of you are familiar with the name <coughs> spatial light modulator. It's just basically... <coughs> Any object, you can read here if you want, but any object, any, any piece of component that can manipulate light in a specific point of space. You can control amplitude, phase, polarization, a lot of things, and you'll see tons of pictures and examples of that. There are many technologies I will focus only in this one, because that's what we have been working for almost 15 years. We can compare that later if you have interest, and you'll see a lot of applications of where is this technology going, what are the problems today, and what will be the cool things that <laughs> we can have in the future. I wanted to start showing this is, this is Jurassic Park today for the world of MEMS. This is maybe 20 years old. This is the kind of thing that we did with the Stanley Bell Labs. The idea was for communication. This is just MEMS devices. The dimension, these are micro machines that can move according you apply a particular voltage, and they can tilt, they can move up and down, they can displace. But this is, again, very old technology. <laughs> this is a, you can see the dimensions. This is a disk that can rotate, as I said. The diameter is of the order of 500 microns. <laughs> Here you can see another one that we have fabricated at Argon, and, and you will see this at the end in a different application. But... <laughs> The, the main application, the main goal of these devices were to, to, to send signal from one optical fiber to another one. You will just connect your computer or anything where you, you use light now to send information from one computer or from one domain to another. And these mirrors are literally mirrors. You can tilt them around and they will reflect the light. This was a very popular... <laughs> I don't know if I want to call it product, but it was a very popular technology a few years ago, and, and it's still in, in under development for a lot of things. But as you see, the devices are, again, 
big for today's standards. This was a small for 15, 20, a small 15, 20 years ago. And, and the, 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 once you, feed, you, have, you are done with these devices, you want to implement it, you want inter to interact and use them in a real world system, you need to use optical elements. And these are the big, big pieces of glasses that we are very familiarized with today with imaging, projection, a lot of things. But this was always the largest element in the system. And if you see this is just a, a cartoon of the, of the real optical system, how you use this. this. This small rectangle here are the MEMS. These are the big lenses. This was a Fourier lens for some different reason. But basically, this is what limits, at the end of the day, the size of your device. <laughs> this is another example. <laughs> Remember this one also, I show it at the end in a different context. This is a device that we have done for confocal microscopy. The idea here is to do probes where you will put the microscope inside the body. You have limitations there because this can go inside arteries, inside blood vessels, but this is basically the device. This is one of the MEMS device. This is a similar MEMS mirror. This can rotate around two axes. Instead of one mirror, you have two here because of uh, <coughs> different a specification of the optical system. It's a dual axis confocal microscopy, but you can see the man's mirror here. It's tilted, it can rotate across this axis and also can rotate around an axis perpendicular to this one, and you have a way to, to cover a very large angular range. You can see a real picture of, of the device integrated with electronic, and this is a real picture of the, uh, of the final product, if you want to call it. This is used for a study ca cervical cancer screening, and you can see the devices. The kind of the, the typical dimensions here is one centimeter, two centimeters. These are really macroscopic objects, in spite that, the, that the, an important part of the constitutive elements are in the micrometer range. As usual, what limits the final size of your device is the lens, the piece of glass that you are using to send light to these elements or to, to collect light from, from them. These are all technology. The, the, the fact that the lenses were a, a, a limited element in the size of the final system has been always very clear. And there has been a lot of interest in, in replace the optics, to replace, again, I will call it the piece of glass, not trying to be disrespectful, but because it's big, uh, to replace with, with, in particular, array of mirrors. So it's a little, very small machines that you can move in different, in different directions. And just by changing the, the constitutive element, you can change the shape of the final object. These are real devices. I will talk a little bit about this now. And <laughs> And, and this will be the final idea. Suppose you want to replace the optics in any system. I'll, I'll show you in a minute what are the big advantages. But in general, I, I like to exemplify what the, how you can create a lens with these little mirrors. And the idea is very simple. If you have a curved mirror, you will illuminate, and you can, in this case, you can focus, or you can, uh, <coughs> you can send light in different directions. The first thing that you can do is you can replace this uniform, continuous piece of glass with little elements like this one, little mirrors that in principle should follow the same pattern. But you are familiar with phase, you are familiar with amplitude of light, and instead of having something like that, if you can have elements like this one, that they can move up and down, and in any particular vertical position you can tilt them a little bit, you can reproduce this shape in principle. The only thing that you need to do is, in addition to move it up and down, you need to tilt them in a way that you can control <coughs> the intensity in addition to, to the change in phase, because when you move this mirror up and down, you can literally change the, the path of the reflective light. <coughs> we can talk about theory if you want, but, but in general, a device like that, this doesn't exist. This is a cartoon, a simulation. If you have a, an array of little MEMS mirrors, little microscopic elements, that each one of them can move up and down, that will control the phase, that change the path of the light, and also you can change the tilt that allow you to control the amplitude, you can enable any arbitrary lens function. The only condition that you need to have is this one. You need to be able to change phase, factor of 2 pi, without losing light. If you lose too much light, it's, it's always a problem in, in optics, as, <coughs> as you know much, much better than me. As I said, this device doesn't exist. The closest device is something like uh, was developed a few years ago, for, for DARPA, the, the application there was uh, to do maskless lithography. I tell you quickly, I'm not going to talk about this, but the idea is, is very simple. It's, I hope, I believe that you all knew how lithography is done. You have masks like that. A mask is a piece of glass with transparent and, and 
<coughs> and opaque uh, regions. If you illuminate, the light will go through the transparent area. If you have the right optics, you can reduce the image. You can literally project the image in the wafer, and you can demagnify the image. In a good stepper, that has the name of this machine, this lens could be, uh, could be a half of this room. And, and you can go the you can get the, the demagnification of the order of 200. The problem is these masks are very expensive. <coughs> it can cost millions of dollars. And if you want to do testing or, or, or if you have mistakes, uh, it's, it's not something very cheap to do. The idea is to replace this lens, this piece of glass again, with an array of mirrors. Uh, it's not showing here, but the goal at that time was to, instead of illuminate from here, you will illuminate this side. You will put your array of MEMS mirror here, and the light will be reflected here. And this is how it will work. Of course, this is a cartoon, but the idea is very simple. If you have a big mirror, which is consisting of a large array of small mirrors, if all of them are at the same height, you illuminate, they will reflect the light. And they will basically project, will be a mirror. Ignore for a second the gap between mirrors. We can chat later about that. If you move one meter, let's look at the center one, lambda over two, for example, you will introduce a change of phase. And in the far field, the light reflected by light, that little mirror will be out of phase with the light reflected from the rest of the mirror. And that will give you a black spot. If you control the height of that mirror continuously, you control the intensity of the light. Instead of being bright and dark, you will have a, <coughs> a series of gray that are important for a lot of applications. <coughs> In that way, <coughs> just by moving one pixel, one meter down, you can create basically a, a project, a, a spot in, in, in the far field. <coughs> As I said, this was done for another application. We can talk later. <coughs> but you can, and I'm not going to talk about how to fabricate this. This was a project of five years, very complicated. But you can see a picture of the real <laughs> macroscopic devices. Look at the sizes here. <laughs> this scale is one micron. We are talking of devices of the order of three by three microns. Uh, this gap in between them is big on purpose just for you to see the spring below. There is a reason why this spring has to be too long because we have it, we wanted to make it very, very soft. But you can see some array here. You can see one array when one mirror has been pushed down independent of the other. Again, <coughs> more pictures. This is let me go back for a second. This is another, the array of pictures, the, as I said, the mirror. If you look below this, we have this spring that I was saying that, again, I repeat, it has to be soft because this, this was integrated with electronic. Below each one of these mirrors, you will have the control in electronic. Now, the, all the area that you have is 3 by 3 microns, very, very small. There is all the electronic that you can put there. The best electronic that exists today won't give you a lot of force to move this down. That's why you need to make these mirrors, these springs below, very, very large. If you remove these mirrors, this is how the spring will look like. It has to be very perfect. You can see there is almost no defect, and, and you can see the <coughs> details of how the, the mirrors go. <coughs> but look at the sizes of the spring now. We are talking of dimensions of the order of 100 nanometers, 120. This is the dimensions and, and the gaps also. Everything now <coughs> is around <coughs> 100 nanometers. Uh, you can see a cartoon also. You can see here the, the spring, how long it is to, to make it very soft. <coughs> but this is one of the problems today with the scaling. Remember, what we are trying to do is to try to put as many little mirrors as we can as close as possible and try to control each one of them independently. And if you want to reduce the sizes, I'm just insisting, you will get to dimensions of the order 100, 120 nanometers. <coughs> and this is basically the best that exists today. And this was done a long time ago, and I tell you what are, is the best from the point of view of density, because if you compare with another spatial light modulator, this is the densest, and it's still the fastest. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but remember, because these mirrors are very small, they are very, very fast. The, the response time here is of the order of microseconds, and, and very few spatial light modulators can do that. But the point now is the following. We have these devices, but the dimensions of this spring, also the gap between mirrors, is of the order of 100 nanometers. And now it's at that regime is where the conventional forces that you use to control micro machines start getting not very good. If you want to apply electro electro electrostatic forces, 
it's very difficult to confine that forces to that small area. You need parasitic, you have parasitic fields, you have fringe fields that is start interacting to each other and that cause you travel. And not only that, I mean, if you want to use light, this is way below the, the wavelengths of the light. You are even below the diffraction limit and there is no chance that you can control that. But the novelty is, as I said, conventional forces are inefficient and near field forces are starting to, f to be important. There are plasmonic forces, there are van der Waals forces, there are very weird forces like the Casimir force that even if you don't have any charge, if you are very careful in avoiding that you don't charge between any charge between this mirror and everything, <coughs> everything is perfect, you can have some quantum mechanical force that could literally attract the mirrors to each other or the spring and you, once these things touch, they get stuck together and you cannot separate. That's why this is literally the best thing that you can see and the limit that you can do. There, there are ways around. I'm not saying that this is <coughs> impossible, uh, but makes everything more complicated, uh, more expensive. For example, to deal with these forces, what we do is we make the spring stiffer. If you make the spring stiffer, you need more forces, and you need more forces, everything gets more complicated. It's more expensive. It's, it's, there are ways around, but, but, the, but we are at this regime where these forces are important. You see, for anybody doing MEMS, micron-sized element, this doesn't exist. You don't even know. To do MEMS, you don't even care. To do MEMS today, you know exactly how to process the material. It's very clear how to simulate the devices. You know how to fabricate it. But in this regime, <laughs> the situation became start, start being a, a little bit complicated. Then remember the goal. What we are trying to do is like kind of like a, an array of mirrors like that, that you can create any shape that you want. But we are reaching a limit from the point of view of, of fabrication and, and, and forces where the dimensions <coughs> are, are complicated. Because of that, <coughs> and again, remember the sizes. The mirrors we are talking are 3 by 3 microns, and the springs width and height also is of the order of 100 nanometers. In part of that, it's a beautiful device. It can move. There are a lot of problems. But, but this is the, the minimum that you will get, Minor, mirrors <coughs> of the order of 3 by 3 microns. In, in part of that, <laughs> the, the thing, people have been starting to explore different approaches, like uh, why can we make this smaller? What can we do if we can eventually control the, the properties of the light in very, very small uh, areas, in very small positions in the space? And this is where the concept of metasurfaces became important. I'm assuming that all of you are very pop f uh, familiar with the Huygens-Fresnel principle. I never know how to pronounce Huygens in the right way. But, but the idea is, as I copy this from this very popular book, uh, if you just have any particular, uh, <coughs> any, any particular uh, object uh, and you illuminate with a uniform wavefront, you can imagine that what you have is, uh, as, it said, uh, as it is here, uh, where it is, uh, that everyone could, is a superposition of very small individual sources of secondary waves that are spherical waves and if you consider the envelope you basically can see the effect of this particular structure on the propagation of light. This is a typical example. This is another example for example if you if you want to study the effect of a the, of a medium for example when the light, the light goes from one medium to another the way that these guys study this is just assuming that you have an array of sources and every time a particular point of light touch the medium, it will start emitting light. Then you see, just by playing with the delay, with the different phase between the light being emitted from every source, you literally can do a lot of things with light. You can see what happened here, and clearly you can see, in principle, Snell law. You can see how you are changing the path of the light. These kind of elementary, infinitesimally small source of light is what now is called metasurface. <laughs> what we can do today is create arrays of nanoparticles where each one of them will literally re-emit light again. <laughs> the first approach to that, <laughs> and will be more clear now, was done by Federico, which is one of these collaborators now, <laughs> was to study, you will see in a minute that there is, in this field there is no much new things. The, the possibility is that you can fabricate this kind of thing and start getting closer and closer to the visible. This kind of antennas is something that people have been studying for years and years. But the theory is very simple. Suppose you have a metallic particle of dimension L and diameter A. If you illuminate this metallic particle with light, 
basically you will put the electrons here to move and this will emit light again. It's an antenna, it's a nano antenna. And these are the properties of this antenna. This, the dark line is basically the amplitude. You see, if you illuminate and the wavelengths of the light that you are using to illuminate is, lambda, the, the, um, is half of the length, or the other way around, L over lambda is a half, basically it will, it will radiate with an electrical field which is almost one. It's almost the same light that you illuminate. This is good because you are sending one light of amplitude one, and this will emit also with an amplitude almost one. And the difference in phase will be pi over two. Then if you play with the size of these of this particles, you literally are changing the amplitude and also the phase. You see, this is a starting to look like a, this, these little dots that I show in the cartoon when, we're explain, when I was explaining the, the Fresnel, the Huygens Fresnel principle, no? And, and people have been doing this for a while with very large objects. You can, if you play with that because you can change the phase locally now, as we were trying to do with the MEMS, you can do a lot of things. In particular, you can have antennas <coughs> and, and you can have a lot of things. People use this recently <coughs> for... <coughs> A longer wavelengths, but the problem is the following. We will see in a minute. This is one example. Sorry to, to I forgot to say that, but this is one paper that Federico was the one who started using these kind of things in the these metallic nanoparticles. <laughs> and, and the idea is very simple. You put a piece of silicon, could be a piece of glass, whatever. You send light, and now each one of them, remember, is locally changing, is emitting light again with a different phase. And you need to be good and try to be in a situation where you don't lose light. The, the amplitude of this light is basically the same that you use to illuminate. Then if you introduce this phase delay, you can literally, with a very, very thin film of metallic nanoparticles, you can change the angle of the light. You are replacing a big microscopic piece of glass, a lens, with an ultra-thin film, literally. <laughs> he demonstrated a lens. <laughs> You see, this, uh, this is how the phase is changing. He demonstrated a lens. You can make rings where each ring consists of particles of very specific shape. And in particular, you can focus light. <laughs> Sounds very good. What's the problem? You focus probably 1%, 2% of the light. 98, 99 go through. <laughs> it's pretty much useless. <laughs> for reasons that we can discuss later, but in particular you can see f this was done for a particular wavelength, that's why the feeling factor is not too good. But the other big, big problem with metals <coughs> is that they have ohmic losses. Everybody here knows that metals have dissipation here, and in particular at visible and the infrared, metals are, are really, really bad. <laughs> this means if you illuminate, if you do this with metals and you illuminate, they will hit, you will literally spend a lot of energy, and from the point of view of manipulate light, <coughs> are really, really bad. <coughs> uh, we can chat this, but, but the shape is associated with the polarization. Remember, I, I mentioned that an ideal device will be, should be able to change the phase into pi. And in particular, with this kind of thing, you need to do <coughs> some complicated tricks. But then this is the problem with metal. <coughs> you lost a lot of light. If I, hand, if I, if I send 100%, 98% go through. It's pretty much useless. And in particular, to get a change of phase of 2 pi, I need to do a lot of very complicated <coughs> game with polarization using the shape of these nanoparticles. That was a big problem, and what we started playing recently <coughs> is using dielectric nanoparticles. Again, the theory here is old. Sometimes you feel sorry showing this, but the novelty here is now you are applying this to visible, and you have, the, from the nanofabrication point of view, it's not trivial. You need to be creative, and I'll, I'll show you something. And the idea is very simple. This is what is called Huygens resonators, because Huygens proposed this resonator, study this. And what you have is very simple. If you study, if you illuminate now a cylinder like this, that, of this, like this shape, made with a dielectric material, you will induce two kind of motion of the, of the structure there, for example. You will illuminate and you will induce, let me compare from the metal for a second. If you have a metal and you illuminate, well, the only thing that you will do is you will move the electrons in a metal. Here there are no free electrons because it's a dielectric particle. But you will have two, you will induce two, two dipolar moments. One is the electrical and the other is a magnetic one. Of course, they are related by Maxwell laws. And the only thing is when you illuminate this, you induce displacement current, and this displacement current would also generate an electrical dipole. <laughs> I'll show you a lot of very fundamental things in a minute. But that is basically the idea. If I illuminate this with light, 
I will have a particle like that, and this is an uh, intensity of the light that this cylinder will scatter. You will see two big peaks. One corresponds to, to a dipolar moment, and the other corresponding to a magnetic moment. And these two <coughs> will be perpendicular in origin. <coughs> the idea is very simple. You can go take your Jackson or any book on, from basic electromagnetism that you like. This is just a pure idea, sim simple system. Choose the, see the equation, and you can see what happened <coughs> in particular with, for a cylinder like this is with a particular shape. When you illuminate, you can see what's the transmission, what's the light that will be, go will be going through, and what happened with the phase. All the questions are there. The novelty here is if you change the size of this particle, you play with the geometry, the radius, the, or the height, you can, in, initially you can literally have these two resonance together. And when these two resonance together, you have a very unique situation, and that's when you have a Huygens resonator. It's literally 100% of the light will go through, and you will have a change of phase of 2 pi. And the idea is <laughs> very simple, uh, and, and I show you this with cartoon. Suppose for a second that you have an electrical dipole pointing in one direction. You have a magnetic dipole orthogonal and you illuminate from above. What you will see is very simple. In the bottom hemisphere, they, they, these two will start exciting, start emitting light. Remember, these are nano antennas, if you want. They, in the bottom hemisphere, they both will emit light in phase. In the upper hemisphere, they will be out of phase. When you ad adapt the contribution, you basically have no light going back, and all the light that you use is going this way. This is one. If you have an array, you can have a beautiful situation where 100% of the light is transmitted. Of course, this is super ideal cartoon, because these two basically, uh, we are assuming that they are the same, that they have the same dipolar moment, that the quality factor is the same, that they interact with the light in, in the same way. But the idea is that these Huygens resonators could be very useful to fabricate these, these, these lenses. Because if you can make an array of these, when you illuminate, you will literally lose no light. 100% should go through. And just by playing with the size, you should be able to control the phase <coughs> of the light going through. As I said before, sorry, I didn't say, as he said, this has not been demonstrated in the visible for reasons that I'm going to show you in a minute. People have been trying to do this. Uh, there has been a lot of effort with silicon for the reason that silicon is the best material in the world. We know how to process silicon. We know how to, how to control the properties of silicon. We know how to put one defect in a billion. I mean, we, we really know how to process silicon. But the problem with silicon is the intrinsic properties of it. And what I'm, going to, I'm showing here is, let's look at the red line, red line sorry, which is silicon. This continuous line is the refraction index. This dotted line is the imaginary part of the refraction index, which means how much the silicon dissipates, and as a function of wavelengths. The number of the refraction index of the silicon is relatively large, which is good for this kind of application. But dissipation is a problem. You see, when you go below 800 nanometers, 700 if you want to be optimistic, this starts going up. And this has been the problem that this won't work in the visible. Remember, if this number, the dotted light line, is big, this means when you illuminate, it will dissipate. And if you dissipate, you waste light. Titanium dioxide is it's a, not a trivial material to fabricate, but, but it's relatively popular. There are a lot of ways to deposit it. The refraction index is a little bit slower, smaller, sorry, but the imaginary part is almost zero. It literally became almost discontinuously large when you go below 400 nanometers which open, open up the door to, to use this material to fabricate lenses that will work in the visible. And this is the material that we're going to show you. There are different uh, structures uh, we use with this one and for, for different reasons, but the main, it, it did require a lot of study to identify which one is the best phase to work in the, <laughs> in the visible. What we did is very simple. Remember what we are trying to do. We have these dielectric cylinders and the only thing we want to do is to find a situation that just by playing with the size and the, the, the size of the cylinder and the distance between cylinders, I'll tell you later about interaction, uh, you can literally control how much light goes through. And now the structure is very simple. It's again a piece of glass. This one we can't get rid of this piece of glass because it's supporting the disk. These are the nanoparticles of titanium dioxide. And what we will do is to study with software like Lumerical, for example, what happened with the transmission when you illuminate here. 
you illuminate from the bottom and you measure what happened on the top. You measure the light. This is theory, and I'll show you experiment in a second, for different gaps and different radius. And look at the results, how interesting they are. Basically, what you have is, this is the scale of transmission. You, you get maximum transmission in several areas for several sizes. But you have this domain where you introduce these magnetic and electrical dipolar resonances where literally you have no light going through. You see, it's just a glass with an array of nanoparticles, no more than that. You illuminate, but for example, if the gap is of the order of 40 nanometers and the radius is of the order of 165, you have no light going through. There is, you, you cannot see too well here, I can show you later, but this is, there is, maybe you see some shade here, but this is the optimum point. This is where you have 100% transmission. It's, it's, it's very good, this material. And the other thing that you need to study, remember, is the phase. You need to know if you can control the phase. The transmission is important because you don't want to lose weight light. But you need to be able, just by changing the size of the particles, you need to introduce, as you can see here, you can introduce a phase delay that you control it with the size of this particle. And this material gives you that possibility because exactly at the dimensions, for example, a gap of 70 nanometers, you have maximum transmission. At the same gap, you, if you change the radius of this particle that amount, uh, that by that amount, you can change the phase in a factor of 2 pi. You see this scale is going from minus pi to pi, and you can see what happened here. If I keep the gap between particles constant, 70 nanometers, and I change the radius from 150 to 160, those two particles will transmit 100% of the light, but the delay in phase that each one will introduce is different. And now, in principle, I have the perfect element. I can f use this <coughs> to fabricate lenses. Before to do that, let's study, let's see if we can reproduce that. This is some of the examples fabricated. This, this is not trivial. You need to do electron beam lithography. You, <coughs> you saw the dimensions. We're talking of gaps of the order of 50, 70 nanometers, and radius of the order of 150. <coughs> this is some of the picture. There are defects, the of course, but you'll see in a moment that they are not important. You can see some structure. We have disks from dimensions changing from 240 to 350 nanometers diameter. The gaps between 30 and 90 nanometer. This is more pictures. You can see difference. This is titanium dioxide on top of glass. This is for a, for a different thing. But look what happened when you finish the experiment. What you have here is glass, and each one of these rectangles is an array, a constant gap, and constant radius. And I, I always forget to put the scale. But remember, the scale is going from like a 30 nanometers to 90. And this is going from of the order of 120 to, <coughs> to 200. There is no sophisticated technique, nothing. You do the patterning, and you go and you put this in the regular microscope, and you go and look. And you see the difference in color. Remember, the only thing that we are changing here is the thickness is the same. The only thing we are changing is the here we keep the gap constant and we change the radius. And here we keep the radius constant and we are basically changing the gap. And this is literally, you can see the colors going through. Remember a little bit, this is, could be confusing, but remember what we are doing now. We are illuminating with white light. And we are starting to see <laughs> a difference of color. The reason that we see red here, remember, is because we just match the condition that will introduce the right delay that some wavelengths will, wavelength will go through, some will introduce a delay that could cancel each other. This is more clear here. You can see this is another one. You can't see too much here, but let me show you. If you illuminate this, this is white light. If you illuminate with red light, you just put a filter, you clearly start seeing the pattern that I showed you before, <coughs> theoretically. And here they are together. This is the, oh, this is getting too long, sorry. Uh, this is, again, constant transmission and we should be able to introduce a change in phase of 2 pi. The trick here is the following. You see, we are illuminating with black, with black, with white light, and we can literally select which wavelengths we want to focus. There are a lot of interest in, in this thing, for example, to create, if you use these lenses, you, one of possibility that is open up is to create color images with white light. That, that is interesting from, uh, very interesting from the point of view of a, uh, money, because that will reduce the cost. The light sources are cheaper than color sources. And in particular, this allows you to do a lot of <laughs> very interesting tricks. This is one example. I'm showing the red, because the red is the easier to do, because the materials properties are, uh, are very good. 
uh, was chatting with some of you today. We, I'm not showing the blue because the blue is not so good, but we are trying to get the blue. Uh, but remember, the blue is difficult to do because we're reaching the limit where the dissipation starts to go up. <laughs> and, and also, the dimensions are smaller, and the critical dimension, the limitations in your fabrication processes start to give your life miserable. <laughs> Let's do lenses with this one. Let's see if now that we, we know that we can control, that we, can <laughs> we have a beautiful point where we can let only the red light go through. Let's see if we can control the face. Of course we can, no, but, uh, but now what we do is a race like that, concentric circles, concentric rings. And each one of these will introduce a change in phase that we know from the simulation that we did before. All of these rings, we, we cannot, for different reasons, we cannot do single particles, but this ring, when I illuminate from this one, will introduce a delay relative to this one, and remember what they will do is will tilt the angle of the light. If you design it right, you literally can focus light. <coughs> and this is a, <laughs> an optical image. You can see the ring here. This is an SEM. These are not defect. This is the, where these rings touch. You see? And that's why you, you have this, this thing of defect. Uh, we initially thought this could be a problem, but so far, you see the results are quite good. And maybe the, the electrical fields, the electromagnetic modes in the vicinity here may be a disaster. <coughs> but we are looking in the far field, and, and all of these things doesn't seem to be important. Again, these are the same pictures I showed before. These are the number of a typical lens, and, and this is how we, this is a real picture of the real structure that we fabricated. You illuminate with white light, and you only focus red light. And for this particular design, 80% of the light was focused. Uh, you can see these are the dimensions. This is 400 micrometers in diameter, 2 millimeter focal length. The numerical aperture is the same numerical aperture that the iPhone. That's why we use it, because the is 0.2. For some of you, some people, when you study, it's 0.2. They say, oh, it's the ap numerical aperture is very small. But there are a lot, a lot of real-world optical systems that use this, this, <coughs> this kind of ap apertures. I'm <coughs> going to speed up. But, but you see what we are doing. We have been always complaining about the size of the lenses is what limits your, your, the final size of, <coughs> of your system. If you have MEMS, you, you need to put the MEMS with lenses. And for all of you who do optical system design, you, you, may, you know that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the size of the MEMS and the size of the lenses and the size of the final system. And that has been always a limitation. Now we can replace these kind of things, <laughs> the lenses, with this kind of a structure. And what makes it much more attractive is these kind of things. Now we are fabricating a lens. We would like to replace this big piece of glass with some film that can be fabricated using a standard semiconductor processing. In ideal, and nobody has done this, this is where this technology is going. Now you can use, in the same way, for in principle, you can fabricate your electronics, you can fabricate MEMS devices, and you can now fabricate your lens on top of everything. And this is a new way to think how you do optical system. It's totally new. I mean, People is starting to see what can be done. It's not very clear what are the limits, what, how good this can, go, this can be. But there are a lot of interesting, <coughs> interesting things. One thing is this one. As I said, we want to get rid of the optical lenses, of the pieces of glass. And um, one of the things that we're doing now, and I wanted to show this, these are uh, um, <coughs> experiments uh, going on right now. But what we are trying to do is, integrate one of those flat lenses that I show, that are a static object, nothing moves. Remember, we're coming from MEMS. When you do MEMS, you want the things to move because that gives you some flexibility. We want to put this on top of a MEMS. And that's what we have been doing. This is one of the, the same MEMS I showed you from the beginning, the one from Jurassic Park. Remember, this monstrosity, 500 microns here. What we are doing is literally put the, the optics on top of the MEMS. And this is a particular one. This is for a different wavelength. That's why this looks so nice, the fabrication. It's a cylindrical lens for <laughs> four micrometers. But what we are doing is <coughs> it's very manual at this stage. We have a postdoc, which is very good with FIB, and he used a, a micro probe after the lens was fabricated. You grab it, and you literally put it on top of MEM. This is not how you will do it if you want to do a product. You need to do this in a, in a mature, in a grown-up <laughs> method. But this is how we look the map. This, this colorful, this kind of violet uh, color that you see there is, is this film on top of it. And now we're doing studies of the dynamic response. I can tell you this is the, the MEMS without the lens. 
This is the MEMS, and I will speed up, the MEMS with the lens on, on top. And basically, there is some changes. The, the dotted line, these are um, uh, the MEMS be without the lens, and this is the one with the lens with the MEMS. From the point of view of the MEMS, the changes that, uh, that you introduce, of course, you will change the MEMS because you are putting something on top, but you don't have any major, <coughs> major impact. <laughs> but the novelty here is, in principle, all the optics that people used before with these MEMS devices should be able to disappear, and you can integrate it with the same with the same element if you want <coughs> this is a project that is just starting with the university of chicago uh, remember i showed you this one at the beginning this was the dual access confocal microscope uh, and this is how the the endoscope look like these are the, the sizes this is if i make a cross section here i didn't want to show you at the beginning it looks like that this is the outer casting there is a big parabolic mirror this is the mirror that goes here. This is the mirror that will be doing this kind of motion. Just to scan, you, you have light coming from here. The light will go to one mirror, will go to the tissue. You will move the mirror, and then you will scan the surface in, inside the body. And here you collect light. Look at the dimensions. The mirror is three millimeters. This is a big lens. You have a solid immersion lens here for different things. There is, there is a lot of lenses in the optical system. What we are doing now is to get rid of all the lenses and replace it with these flat lenses, with this, this array. This work well because this work at a single wavelength. Just to be honest, and if you want to think about this, one of the main limitations of these flat lenses <coughs> is that they work for one wavelength. You literally design it, uh, uh, the piece of glass that is here in our camera works with any wavelengths in the visible. There is aberration, the focal point changes a little bit with the wavelength, but, but we can take care of that, that's not a problem. But this is one of the limitations. These lenses, you fabricate them for a single wave. There is so far, uh, there are some crazy ideas, but I haven't seen anything. There is nothing very reliable to make these lenses literally broadband or, or achromatic. But for this kind of application in medicine or for communication, you only live with one wavelength, and these lenses are, in principle, perfect. Anything that you want to put inside the body, the smaller, the better. And and, and this is in particular, uh, i tell you quickly what it is, we can chat, and uh, my role here is just to design this kind of element, but, but the idea is to reduce this diameter from 10 millimeters <coughs> to less than one, because uh, the plan is to see if you can develop an endoscope that you can use it inside the blood vessels in the brain, where the dimensions are of the order of one millimeter, or, well, you know, the blood vessels will eventually get very, very thin. But if you can get this kind of technology inside the brain, it in principle could be uh, very, very good. I'm <laughs> finishing here. Uh, as I said, uh, this is dying. To have lenses in, in different colors is a challenge. We, we have demonstrated the red, the green, the blue is still being difficult. But there are plans to make what is called an achromatic lens. Achromatic and broadband are not the same. Achromatic, basically, if you can deal with at least three wavelengths, you can start doing imaging. In principle, one thing that you can do here is one lens for the red, one from the green, and one from the blue, and put the one on top of the other. But, but it gets very complicated, because these are very thin films. It's doable. You can do it in the lab. But if you want to make a very good system that is manufacturable, and you can do something, as I said before, that you can fabricate your MEMS, your electronics, and your lenses together, you need to find ways <coughs> to do something that will allow you to, to send three different wavelengths <laughs> to the same point. There are people trying to do things in the infrared. Nobody has succeeded, in, at least in the, in the, visible, in the visible domain. But, but this is part of the work. I'm <coughs> finishing here. Uh, it was not too long. I, I can show you some of the examples in a minute because some of you were asking me before. But, but, but this is where this technology has been evolving. You saw big, big lenses. <laughs> that we're doing were very useful from a, a, a lot of technology. Uh, the limitation there with the lenses. They were interested to replace the lens with MEMS, like a, this kind of thing. This, from the point of view of SLMs, is a still the best that you can get today. But it reached a limit where a lot of fundamental forces and properties of the material are a problem. And people is going now in this direction, where we have this array of devices. While this can be moved, and you can do real-time reconfiguration, these are static. But by combining this with MEMS, in principle, <coughs> you can bring some, some levels of, of dynamic to, to this thing. I'm finishing here. This is a list of collaborators. All of this was done in the, in the Center for Nanoscale Materials at Argonne. And we are here close to a synchrotron. 
It's a great machine to produce a grace, but, uh, uh, but thank you very much. <laughs>